Welcome to Hail Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hail Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Welcome to it. Great to have you on a Wednesday, midweek edition of Tail Bar City Radio. We're presented by Currency for all your equipment financing needs. Go Currency, Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal. As uh, the silly season continues, <laughs> the carousel man keeps on cranking. What's the latest? Well, uh, we will uh, dive into it all. And oh, yeah, there's a football game happening. On Friday, we'll be in Iowa City at the Marriott in Iowa City, right by Kinnick. Noon to 2, Black Friday show. So you're invited there. But uh, we'll get kicked off here very shortly with Damon Benning. He will join us, part of the Husker Network and broadcast team, of course. And uh, his new show gets rolling next week. So we'll talk with Damon here in a bit. Uh, a few minutes away from Mike Babcock, Mike Schuhart, and then Gary Barnett will join us to preview the weekend. Nebraska, Iowa, and the coaching search. Scott Docterman also chimes in from The Athletic. Get his take on the matchup, Iowa and Nebraska. Numbers to get in today on Hale Bar City Radio. You can join us at 466 37 76 37 76 800 825-5865. Those are the phone lines to dial up. Can watch the show as we stream on different platforms for you. ESPN Lincoln Facebook, ESPN Lincoln Twitter, and the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter handle at H Varsity Radio. Email the show Chris at HaleVarsity.com and can find us and give us a follow. On Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio or at Herbal Essence for Elijah Herbal. So what is real? What is smoke? What's uh, really going on with this Nebraska coaching search right now? The name the last 24 hours uh, that you've been attentive to has been Luke Fickle. Uh, What would it take to get him out of Cincinnati? Uh, Would he be a big time get for the Big Red? Uh, Absolutely. Is uh, Matt Rule back in play? And, uh, you know, Matt Rule's a guy that the coaches we talked to said the guy was going to sit out. He had things lined up to see if he liked the the media uh, circuit doing some NFL network this morning. And uh, if you listen to Matt Rule, Matt Rule missed coaching already. We welcome in a coach who just helped win a state championship with Westside and does great work with uh, the Nebraska football broadcast and gets things kicked off next week. Coffee and cream on ESPN Lincoln 7 to 9 mornings. Damon Benning with us. Mr. Benning, do you have your turkey picked up? <laughs> I do. It's going to go on the Brian. I've got to leave with the team tomorrow at 2. So I won't get to eat it, but uh, Friday night when I get back, I'm hoping for a nice meal, man. How are you guys doing? We're good. Hey, congrats uh, on everything, and and, uh, welcome on to to ESPN Lincoln Airwaves and and, uh, all the great stuff you're doing, man. Let's lay out, before we dive into the ball game Friday and the coaching carousel, uh, Damon, tell us a bit about coffee and cream, bud. Yeah, it's, it, listen, it's a morning show. Andrew Rogers and myself, uh, we're going to go 7 to 9. We'll, we'll do a third hour, and, and uh, we'll, we'll go podcast with that, at least for right now, just making sure that we get the content that the listeners want. It uh, gives us a chance to – it's different. It, we hope to be creative. Andrew's kind of the funny one. He's creative. Uh, I'm the guy that he's going to have to kind of wrangle in, the boring guy with all the stats. So hopefully the old guy (laughs) and the new guy will give it a chance to work. But I just think we wanted to do something different. Um, You know, a live local radio morning show um, on 1480. And just, just, you know, to be fresh and and try to provide a different perspective that isn't already out there. And and, uh, I've got a really good partner in Andrew that I'm excited about. Maybe you can get the old guy to, to, to be young again, man. Maybe I'm just kind of looking for that fountain of youth and Hale Varsity Radio and, and Andrew and, and all the folks, as you know, 
uh, in the big office uh, will give us a chance to do that, man. So 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, over the air, and, and we're looking forward to it on 1480 ESPN Radio. Damon Benning is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio, at Damon Benning on Twitter. Damon, uh, excited for that, and it's been, well, to, to put it nicely, interesting here the last uh, several <laughs> several days, but, but more so this season's been yeah. interesting as, as you're a, a proud Husker. You know, what's your, uh, your assessment here of, of the job that's been done between the lines with Nebraska football, just Mickey and the crew, what you've been able to see uh, week in, week out from the guys. Yeah, I just tell you, I think most of the, the the bulk of the heavy lifting has been done, you know, Sunday through Friday, kind of what you haven't seen on the football field, just to kind of emotionally rehab this team, get them recalibrated, feeling good about themselves, uh, believing in the program. The, the coaching staff doing a fantastic job, you guys. I, I'm serious when I say this about reminding the players that they're the most important people in that building. Because I think some of that has kind of gotten away a little bit over the last handful of years. And it's easy to not feel good about yourself when you're not winning football games. And, and there aren't a lot of positive things said about you. So just the infusion of confidence and belief and kind of camaraderie, having one vision has been fantastic. And then some of the things you've seen on the field, uh, I mean, listen, the, the, the defense, and, and I get it, they haven't gone against premier offenses, but the ability to kind of rally, uh, adjust to a new scheme, overcome injuries. I mean, this is not a deep football team to begin with. And what they've been able to do, Miles Farmer starting to hit his stride, uh, you know, Buford was playing at a much higher level than he had been, and, and he's a guy that I would go to bat with and wishing him a speedy recovery on his injury. Gifford really starting to settle in. Ernest Hausman coming around. And Luke Reimer has been steady Eddie. So they have some pieces. And my guy Quentin Newsom in, in Herzog. I don't want to forget about Quentin Newsom, who I think ultimately will be playing on Sundays. I know that kind of sounds silly, but uh, his skill set has been fantastic. So defensively, They've, they've, they're, they're starting to come together. They just haven't had the numbers, I think, to really execute what, who they really want to be. The special teams guys, Bleak Road and, and Bushini, have been great. Uh, I think they're still trying to figure out the punt return game. But the special teams as a whole, I think, has been pretty good. And we know about the offense. Um, just trying to establish an identity of who they want to be versus who they feel they have to be. Those two things are definitely at odds. I think who they have to be is a team that plays to Casey Thompson's strengths and gets the wideouts of the football. Uh, who they need to be is a team that runs the football and takes their deep shots off of run action. They just aren't, haven't had the opportunity, I think, to have that identity kind of settle in. That in those days... I think are coming. So it's been baby steps, understanding the day-to-day, clock management, uh, situational play calling, being on the same page. All those things have been a work in progress. But with Coach Joseph and him being as competitive as he is and who I truly think is a lifelong learner, he's looked at every day as a day to get better while he continues to stay in the moment and lead his guys. Damon Bidding is with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. And, Damon, you mentioned Mickey there at the end. I want to get your take on the job Mickey has done this season, not on the field, but off the field. Where do you think this team was at uh, back on September 11th when Scott was let go? And what was the job that Mickey had to do, not only to, to keep this team bought in, but keep this team bought in through all the adversity they've faced over the past three weeks? He said earlier this week he's expecting them to fight against Iowa despite the 3-8 and eight record. Well, what kind of job has he done to keep this team invested in the season? So I think the two good things about Coach Joseph, number one, he's never been the favorite. He's always been an underdog. And so I think it's naturally in his personality to want to compete. This team has become a reflection of their coach, and they just fight by nature. It's the next man up, and he's been able to instill and kind of inject some emotional confidence. And and by that, I mean when your feet hit the floor in the morning, you understand firmly that you have value. It's not in the results 
of, of what happens on Saturday that gives you your worth. It's the fact that you're breathing, waking, getting a chance to go to, to class and go to work with your fellow brothers that gives you value. You're not here by some sort of coincidence or fluke. And by taking the results of wins and losses out of it, it's really allowed this team to focus into the essence of being functional, responsible young men. And I think that that's something that they can always take pride in. So that emotional injection in terms of self-worth and value is the number one reason, you guys, why they continue to play hard against seemingly insurmountable odds. The other thing is clarity of message. He's so authentic, and he tackles each day, each day. So there is no checking of the rearview mirror. There is no fast-forwarding to things that he can't control. And that right there, by modeling that behavior, has really kind of infused itself into this football team where they're very good about staying in the moment when it would be easy to kind of digress and look back and reflect and think about what could have been or what hasn't been. He's done a really good job about uh, of, of instilling and modeling, staying in the moment, now making this a one-game season. Damon Benning with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Damon Benning, Andrew Rogers get things kicked off next week on ESPN Lincoln, Coffee and Cream, 7 to 9. Damon, uh, where do you think Nebraska's at with the coaching search? Uh, a lot of smoke right now with Matt Rule back in play. Luke Fickle's a name. Of course, Mickey has uh, uh, that locker room loves him. What's your take? I, th- I think Trevor's going to do his due diligence. Um, I know that he's had a good sit down with with, with Coach Joseph, uh, that's where it started. That's the conversation that had to be had first. I think he got a clear layout and a plan from Mickey on what he would bring to the table. And I think he's been very thorough in the process. You know, some of the other names that have been floated out there, obviously, uh, it's not without merit, whether it's Matt Rule or, or some of these other guys that have come into play. But I would caution Nebraska fans on this because – the search has gone in the manner in which it, it has in terms of time frame. I firmly believe, and this isn't lip service, you guys know me, I, I'd rather be right than well-liked, so I wouldn't say anything that I don't believe to be true. I think the search has gone about how Nebraska thought it was going to go. They have done their due diligence. They've collected a tremendous amount of data. Uh, I think Trev, the firm, uh, they know percentages uh, they, the, they understand win-loss records. They understand recruiting, um, r- recruiting plans. They understand how it, it fits with their roster, how it fits geographically, where I think candidates have had success, what their strengths are, and what it means to be a part of the university. And this is the first time, guys. What, the thing that I'm excited about is Nebraska has had kind of poor timing in terms of leadership versus coaching acumen. And I think this time is the first time since the early 2000s that you'll have good leadership in the power chair in terms of the athletic director and that cabinet, that administrative team, and a competent staff in terms of what you can give a head coach and what he needs and have those two things fit together. You know, you can go back to Callahan and – Say what you want about that staff versus the leadership. That was disjointed. After that, you know, Coach Pelini, uh, competent coach, inadequate leadership. Uh, you, you go to what happened after Coach Pelini. I felt like Coach Riley, competent coach. I know it's popular to have him be kind of the whipping boy. That's unfair. I don't feel like that leadership was adequate, did not surround him with the best opportunities to be successful. And then we it's well documented with Bill Moose and, and Coach Frost. So, I think what's exciting and what should be exciting for Husker fans is have faith in this leadership. Uh, It's more about, it's more than just about Trev's charisma and the smooth words behind the mic and the good looks. I think he's firmly about the method and the plan. He understands the fan base. He didn't do surveys and conduct research and talk to the search firm to go willy nilly and not have it go according to plan. I, I think they're on schedule. He let us know 
weeks ago that it wasn't going to be anything premature or rushed, and he was going to give the student athletes every opportunity to have success. And that means not interrupting their season and allowing them to be coached to the best of this staff's ability with as limited distractions as they can, because as he's always said, it's up to this football team and this administrative staff to cut out the background chatter and just go to work. And I think that's what he's tried to do to give them every opportunity to have success on the football field. Damon Benning with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Add Damon Benning on Twitter. Damon Benning, Andrew Rogers, get things kicked off next week, 7 to 9 ESPN. Lincoln FM 1015, 1480 AM. Coffee and cream in the mornings. Damon, best to you and your fam. Have a great Thanksgiving. We'll see you in Iowa City, bud. Yeah, let me know when you guys get there uh, at night. I'll be in my hotel doing nothing, and so maybe we can catch up when you guys get there. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, and, and make sure the, the folks tune in uh, next Monday. We'll try to be different, be who we are in that same vein, but uh, quality content just like you guys are used to. Absolutely. You take care, Dame. We'll talk soon, bud. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate you guys yeah. having me. There he is, Damon Benning. Good to hear from him. Getting kicked off here, uh, Turkey Day Eve. Mike Babcock's on the way with Hale Varsity, presented by Currency. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Big thanks to Damon Benning for getting us kicked off. Hale Varsity Radio on a Wednesday. Mike Babcock, I, I, I can't smell, but I'm going to guess that there's there's some stuffing and some gravy and some dare I say, green bean casserole, 24 hours. That's what we can say 20 out, 24 hours from now, Elijah, that there will be Thanksgiving goodies with the, the Babcock household. Mike, how are we doing, bud? I'm doing fine. Hey, thanks for having me. I agree with Damon Benning. Uh, have a happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> yeah. Mike, yeah. T- tell us, tomorrow, we, we yesterday we went through the, the main dishes, you know, your turkey or your prime rib or your ham. Today, I, I want to get into ask the you, coaching search. Screw the Thanksgiving. <laughs> I was going to ask about pie quickly. Let's warm up Mike a little bit. But, Mike, well, what, what's your pie of choice tomorrow? I personally think pumpkin pie is overrated as hell. It's good, but it's very overrated. Do you have a pie of choice for Thanksgiving? Uh, probably anything but pumpkin pie. It's overrated. Uh, I'm with you. It's pecan. I like, the, I like stand like apple pie or cherry pie or something like that. Okay, so I'm not a pumpkin pie person. So of this, uh, of these names that have been out there in the coaching search candidate, who is the pumpkin pie of the coaches? <laughs> I don't know. Every Mike, day, Mike's I like saw next the question. That Gary Patterson's back in the hunt, right? Oh dear God, no! <laughs> Gary Patterson's <laughs> the the pumpkin pie in the in the Babcock uh, draft. Uh, uh, yeah, putting, let's uh, let's just get to the Iowa game and forget about. It. They'll have a coach when next season begins. We know that. Yeah, that'll be good. That'll be good. Well, you have a, a name in, in Matt Rule that seems to have reemerged the last 24 hours, and maybe part of that is is Rule going on TV and going, you know, this is kind of fun, but, man, I miss coaching. That's his tone, right, Elijah, right, Babbers? That was the tone today with him being on Good Morning Football. Either that or he's just really, really – awesome at selling himself and firing up several different fan bases be it nebraska or auburn well i, I have the audio pulled up if we want to take a listen to it let's let's hear matt rule real quick and, and babbers i hope you hear this we're going to pray that you hear it we'll uh, we'll let it fly here all right um you know i don't i don't know mm-hmm. I, I really don't um you don't uh if I go back three years ago, I was, I was sitting at my table in uh, uh, uh waco texas and i had a, i had a pretty good life you know yeah. and um I made the decision to, to come to the NFL because I, I wanted to do it. And uh, my son was uh, my son was going into his freshman year of uh, high school, and really I had two goals. I wanted to number one, I wanted to win the Super Bowl and bring a, a championship to Carolina. I feel like they deserve that. But I also wanted my son to graduate high school. You know, I, I've moved around. He's been to so many different schools, and, and I just wanted to give him the gift of hey, you can go to high school in one place. Mm-hmm. He's been to 12, 13 different schools. Is that right? So yeah, so he'll be a senior next year. And um, you know, I was kind of like, all right, this happened. You know, I'll, I'll obviously listen to things. I know this. I don't care where I coach. It has to be the right fit. Mm-hmm. It has to be the right people. It's not really where. It, I've learned it's who. And um, but you know, my son said to me. He actually said it to me last night. He said, Dad, you need to coach. Mm-hmm. Like, I want you to coach. I'm like, but it's, it's your it's your senior year, man. You're on the basketball team. You're on the That's golf really cool. team. He's like, Dad, um, you know, 
players, young people, they, 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 that's what you do. Mm. And so, I mean, I watched you do Bravion earlier from in, in the green. Like, mm. like I coached Bravion in college. Like, my daughters know him. Like, that's cool. so, so I don't know where I'll coach. I loved the NFL. I loved college football. Uh, more, most importantly for me, I loved uh, pouring into young people. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it stinks getting fired. I mean, it's terrible. It sucks, yeah. But but the calls and the text messages, like Deion Dawkins texted me, and I'll tell you this, man, it, it, it meant more to me than anything else, the things he said to me. And so I just want to have an impact on people. Yeah. So whenever that comes, I don't know when it will be. Um, but I got my son pushing me. What, let's go here. Let's go there. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, maybe it could be Monday. It could be two years from now. But when it comes, you know, I'll, I'll be ready. Uh, so he's, did you get any of that, Babbers? Yeah, I did. I okay. So he, uh, he touched on his family life. You can imagine the, the coaching uh, life of, of families and having to uproot and move in 12 to 13 different schools. So. Uh, his kid got to settle down in, in, in Charlotte, but, you know, if, if Nebraska moves forward and goes with, with Rule, uh, let's play that hypothetical for a moment, a guy that's built, Mike, and a guy that is uh, good at, at doing well in places he's not familiar, uh, specifically going in and, and really hitting it off with a lot of the Texas uh, area high school coaches first, but doing well with decent recruiting numbers but more so on the development side yeah well development's important obviously and recruiting is important nebraska is a little bit different situation than being at baylor and being in that recruiting area of texas and he made the decision i think to hire uh two or three high school coaches as assistants we talked about this i mm -hmm. think uh one of whom is now the head coach at texas tech um so he was very wise in making his connections uh, to a state with which he had no really background um, to get those coaches on his staff, to get those connections to recruiting, which was an important part of, it's an important part of any, any uh, coaching position in college, I think. But uh, certainly at Nebraska, it's an important thing because, um, you know, low population base here, um, you've got to get uh, you've got to get in the area. I think it was always 500 mile radius for Osborne. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of the way coach. Martin, Ma we've seen that he's been able to do that at Temple uh, and at Baylor. Um, so the, his resume looks good, and when your son says, "Hey," You need to be coaching. I think you probably pay more attention to that even than your own reaction to what, you know, do I want to be an analyst on TV or, um, you know, do I want to get back into coaching? When, it, you know, if my son said that to me, that would probably be the, the thing that tipped it in the direction of wanting to coach again. But he finished it with saying it could be Monday, it could be two years from now. Mm. Well, do you, do you think that Monday is a weirdly specific date to throw down in a, in a random interview on Good Morning Football? <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> I thought that was a little bit curious there uh, to say that, given the situation here. And, um, you know, seasons, the regular seasons end for schools. And the good thing about his situation is he's not coaching a team that's going to a bowl game or something like that which creates another issue or consideration uh, when you're looking at a new coach. And, I, and I'm not in favor of coaches that have a team that's going to a bowl game and then they abandon the team uh, at that point uh, to take another coaching job. You know, I like to see a coach finish out just as I like to see players do that. And I know now players more and more are opting out of bowl games if they don't mean anything. Well, Mike, do you also think it's interesting that now is the time that Matt Rule goes and gets on Good Morning Football, and not to, to read too far into the tea leaves here, but he got fired over a month ago. And the fact is, I, mean, I understand needing to decompress and whatnot, but it seems strange to me that not only that he did a, an interview on Good Morning Football, but he also did uh, an interview with the 33rd team uh, the other day, which podcast. is a podcast mm -hmm. network. Yeah, and, and he did an interview with them earlier this week as well, and it's 
back-to-back interviews within a week, and I I hate to read the tea leaves here, but it's just strange to me some of the timing and some of the things he's saying, and it makes me wonder what's going on behind the scenes. The fact that this is the week that he's choosing to do interviews, the week that the college football season ends and the the week before he could potentially be announced at a a school, say, Nebraska. Yeah, yeah, and and, okay, uh, so... Leroy Jethro Gibbs on NCIS says, there is no such thing as coincidence. Um, <laughs> so maybe your reading of tea leaves <laughs> fits that. You know, we're to the point where we maybe need to read tea leaves uh, in this whole thing because Twitter's not doing us any good. <laughs> uh, so so maybe, that's, maybe that's it. But it, 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 is, it certainly is curious that these things happen in this time frame and the situation at Nebraska is this. You know, there is no bowl game. Iowa's the last game. Everybody's anticipating something to happen, um, whether it's uh, Saturday or Sunday. It's probably not going to be Saturday, mm. whether it's Sunday or Monday, probably. And and for him to say that, it's like you're flipping over the tea leaves there and you're seeing what's underneath. Mike, uh, a thought on, on Luke Fickle, because that's the other name mm-hmm. that – there may be some mutual interest, and in, if you're if you're Luke Fickle, do you do you jump back to the Big Ten if given the right offer? And uh, Nebraska's NIL uh, war chest w- would be very appealing. Yeah, uh, do, is there some sense that Fickle wasn't interested in leaving the state of Ohio, or did I see that on Twitter? Which I should have erased that immediately. <laughs> well, he's um, never he's never left. He's never been outside the state of Ohio. He's gone from Ohio State to Cincinnati. Yeah, I, I knew that part. I didn't know if there was more to it than that. Um, he certainly understands the Big Ten. You mm-hmm. know, there's no question about that. Um, that's one of the things that you have to have, you know, whether you understand it from experience or you, in rules case, if you come in and you, you learn quickly, Uh, what it's going to be because we don't probably want to go through another thing of what Scott Frost said when he came here was the Big Ten probably going to have to adjust to us. Not going to happen that way. I think you're going to have to adjust to the Big Ten, whoever the coach is. Um, And uh, Fickle wouldn't wouldn't have to adjust from that standpoint because he has the experience in the Big Ten. I'm sure he understands it. Mike, just gut instinct between the two rule on Fickle. Which name piques your interest more in I asked this question, it's probably going to be somebody completely else out of left field that we're not even expecting right now. But those are the two hot names today. Between those two, who are you picking? you picking Luke Fickle you picking Matt Rule? I, I would pick Rule between those two. Um, but, uh, again, you know, I, I said from the beginning I'd, I'd like to have Mickey Joseph get the opportunity. Uh, the more this goes along, the more I think that's probably not going to happen. But um, I really think that uh, – He's done a good job from the standpoint, obviously, wins and losses, if you evaluate that, is, is not a good thing. But the relationships he's built with the players and the attitude that he's established with the players, I think, is really uh, some significant accomplishment given the circumstances of how he got to be the interim head coach. But, you know, going back to your question, of, the, of those two, I'd say the rule probably. Mike, about 30 seconds, Black Friday. Give me away, Nebraska gets out of Iowa City with an upset. Um, just keep on trucking. Just keep doing what you've been doing, you know, and and maybe the break is going to go your way finally um, because I think this team is not going to give up. I think they're going to play hard. They're going to play to the end. Um, but you, you've got to be gritty and you got to be tough to play a team like Iowa, which – that's what Iowa depends on to, to be successful and play some good defense. Mike Babcock, Mr. Husker Football Historian, Author, Hall of Famer at MD Babs on Twitter. Read him with Hale Varsity Magazine, HaleVarsity.com. Mike, best to you and your fam. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for double duty today, bud. Thank you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Appreciate it. There he is, Mike Babcock with us. Uh, we're mowing forward here this first hour. Hail Varsity continues. We're presented by Currency. Chime in 402 466 ESPN or email the show Chris at HailVarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Gary Barnett, 
In about 20 minutes, Scott Docterman, before we are done on Nebraska, Iowa, and uh, the two names that continue to heat up today, Luke Fickle and uh, Matt Rule back in the race, uh, apparently. Uh, more thoughts on that. Reminder to get buckled up if you're hitting the road, not just for the holidays or Thanksgiving, but any time. One of every three fatal crashes in Nebraska involves an alcohol-impaired driver. Why take chances? If you drink, don't drive. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. Here to squash the rumor that that he is a bad putter, and I'm, he being Matt Rule, uh, Mike uh, Shuhart with Wilderness Ridge. Shuey doesn't doesn't rule look like a guy that that is uh, I putt for dough versus drive for show. Uh, yeah, I, I can see that definitely. And he, to <laughs> me, looks like the type of guy too that that would just channel his inner John Daly. Well, Gol- he's got that John Daly build. Go- yeah. Golf pant wise, he would just say forget about it. Any color goes together. I think so. I mean, he looks that way. I think he could probably put a putter over his knee pretty quickly, too. And <laughs> put it in two pieces without any hesitation. How have you soaked this uh, this week of the coaching search? Oh, it's just been, I've kind of put it on the back burner and like, it will be what it will be mm-hmm. kind of thing. I mean, you just so many people's names and ideas and directions and it's like whoa 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 i just hope they hire the guy that can can fix this thing i mean it would be a, be a miracle they haven't hired the right guy for a long time so hopefully they can get it right this time but mike am i crazy to say it shouldn't be as hard as some previous coaches have made it look and i'm not saying this is an easy turnaround by any means there's a lot of obstacles here but you also have the 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 NIL benefits here and the, the support of Husker fans and just the money that's on hand now, not only with Big Ten media rights, but uh, again, back to NIL and the, the facilities here in Nebraska, it just doesn't seem like it should be as hard as what some previous coaches have made it look like. Uh, no, it shouldn't be that hard at all. I mean, obviously it's not a, it's not a hotbed of recruiting, but I mean, you have a tradition, you have facilities that are second to none. Um, you have an academic uh, support system that's second to none now with NLI. I mean, there's a lot of good things that are available here. It's just that you got to find the right guy that can that can coach the style of ball that needs to be coached to be successful in that league. You know, and they haven't done a very good job of that. Mike Schwartz with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf, and uh, get out and see Shuey for your Thanksgiving Day brunch. Uh, don't jack. I mean. You know what? Maybe you're rolling the dice if uh, if you or your wife just aren't great turkey cookers. I, I get it. I can't do it. So let the professionals help. Am I right, Mike? And no question about it. It's like, why take a chance on it not turning out very well? Uh, and the, there's a high probability that's going to happen. Or go somewhere where you know it's going to be good. So I'll take that. I'll take the second option. Think of Cousin Eddie's wife. That's all I'm saying, right? <laughs> uh, Shuey, are you worried about Mickey's future with the program? I ask that, and, and to me, it's it's a no-brainer to have such a high high-level asset stay with the program. Find a way, make a way, become a reality uh, if and when this change slash announcement happens with the Nebraska head coach. No question. I mean, he's the only person that I've listened to for the last 20 years that I actually believe he actually cares about the program. He truly cares about the program, cares about his players, uh, and, he, and he feels like he can do something to make it right, to make it better, to make an influence on it. You know, I mean, I've, everybody else is all about themselves or or how good they can be or whatever. It's like he truly cares, at least it sounds like, Mm -hmm. that uh, and believes that the program can be great. So you don't don't usually just kick those people to the curb, man. You You need to somehow incorporate those people and that positive energy and belief uh, onto your system to, to help make it work. 
All right, putter to your head. <laughs> Rule or fickle? Uh, I think it's fickle. That's that's your gut right now. You think fickle's yeah, the guy? I do. Okay. I do. Is fickle your preference over rule, or is that just you reading the tea leaves? Uh, just me reading the tea leaves. I don't like either one of them. I, I'd rather take Mickey in. <laughs> well, to be honest with them, I kicked their ass in golf the other day, so <laughs> they haven't paid me yet. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah, but... Shu, you haven't seen any, you know private golf events maybe featuring Trev Alberts out at Wilderness Ridge within the past week. I know you probably couldn't Trev, tell us if you had. It's not been a Trev for some uh, shoey Trev and, <laughs> and a guy that used to be at Baylor and a guy that has Bearcat gear. <laughs> no. I don't, I don't. I haven't seen any of that. I don't anticipate seeing any of that. So. And if he did, he wouldn't be able to tell us anyway. Yeah, of, right. of, the, of the former coaches that have graced their time at Wilderness, who's probably been the best golfer? That's a great question. Oh, that is a great question. Everyone's surprised in the room. Wow, that's a really good question. <laughs> of the coaches. She was uh, like, oh, they came up with one. Huh? Wow. Who is our de- offensive coordinator? Um, Whipple? No, no, no. This was five, eight years ago, ten years ago. There's been 48 uh, offensive coordinators, Shoe. You're putting me on the spot. <laughs> He's pretty good. He went bad. Langsdorf? That, no, not him. Blonde haired guy. So not Tim Beck. No. No, 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 no. Mm-hmm. Well, hold on. Because we had Beck. Uh, Let me see. Who's before Let me see Beck? Oh, uh, Watson? Yeah, there you go. Sean Watson, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sean Watson. Thank you. I Blonde. lose my memory now. The older right. I get, lose my memory. Thank her wasn't bad either. No, Bank Banker was a happy guy. Every time I'd see him, man, he was he was enjoying himself. Yeah, Banker, good golfer. Shuey, uh, tell folks real quick here about Wilderness and uh, the Turkey Day brunch. Yeah, I mean they have uh, uh, the fabulous Thanksgiving Day brunch. Uh, I'm not so sure it's not sold out. Gotcha. Might be able to get in last minute, but there'll be a lot of food, a lot of really good food. Whatever you want, anything you want you can't find it there, then probably can't find it. Mm. So it is all you can eat and then some. It's fabulous. It's fun. Looks like it's going to be a nice day. Mm-hmm. So stuff yourself and then watch the football the next day. How about that? That'll be good. A little Black Friday. Shuey, uh, best to you. We'll catch up next week. Thanks for squeezing us in. You got it. Everybody have a great Thanksgiving. There he is, Mike Shuhart with us, Wilderness Ridge Golf. Go get your turkey on uh, with them tomorrow and uh, enjoy. Check out some memberships as well. I, I, you know, if it's not DEFCON 2 coaching search Wednesday, it would have been fun to sneak out and play 18 today. As nice as the weather's been. It's, uh, not during football season. Can't do it. Not during football season. That's uh, Save that for summer. 15 minutes. Gary Barnett, his thoughts on the carousel and... Scott Docterman, Hail Varsity continues. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time this hour, it's Hail Varsity, presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. Off tomorrow to get fat and happy, and then hit the road to Iowa City. Noon to 2, Black Friday show. Myself, Elijah Herbal, uh, a crane act sighting. And uh, we are going to be at the Marriott Rooftop Tailgate. Come on by, get a beer, and uh, figure it out as things kick off at 3. Then Real Red Reaction follows from the Marriott, and uh, we will make and uh, break land speed records. I've got a Hawkeye riding with me to and from, so we'll make sure he's in the front seat. Love you, Iowa Russ. So when we do get pulled over, if we get pulled over, at least there won't be that token, oh, you're from Nebraska. We we have an Iowan with us. Little little professional courtesy. Just ha- he needs to put on some Hawkeye gear too while you're driving. I know that's going to make things tough for you, but if he puts on some Hawkeye gear, oh, he, he'll 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 be wearing it to and from. That, that, well, then it's rolled down the window, and the the cop looks in and says, "Godspeed, fellows," and yeah. walks off. Do you need an escort? <laughs> 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 yes. So listen, I 
this thing's been usual suspects. If you know the movie, there's 48 twists and turns, and who's Kaiser so say? Right? Who's going to be the next Nebraska football coach? You can talk yourself into 100 different people because there's been 100 different candidates. You had the Mickey Love the first couple of games of the year when Nebraska bounces back, and things have kind of tailed off there. Uh, you had the, the, the rule possibility that was kind of hit or miss, and now maybe it's a hit again. Uh, Luke Fickle, the last 24 hours. Uh, I loved what I heard from Mitch Sherman yesterday on Fickle. Y- you got to wonder if there's some mutual interest if, if you're Fickle's representation and for sure if you're Nebraska. And I, I guess what I come back to with Fickle, and I don't know if he's gettable or not. I really, I really don't. I don't know who's gettable, who's trying to get a raise. I know we know who has gotten raises. Okay, we know that the three coaches have gotten raises. Mitch laid out a really good nugget too this morning over on KFOR with us, part of our Wednesday tailgate. That uh, when it comes to Leipold getting the extension, uh, it was Nebraska moving on from Leipold uh, per Mitch's information, and and Leipold had that contract on his desk for a while, so it wasn't just all right, gun to head type deal. So. I've, I've the last 24 hours. I, I if you're a Nebraska fan, it, it's okay to get excited about Fickle because of what he's done in the Big Ten and what he's done at Cincinnati. And when he's gone and taken on some SEC teams, he lost to Georgia by three in a New Year's Day six two years ago, and he got beat by 21 points. But they hung around a lot a lot longer than most teams did. Uh, with Alabama in the co- in, in the college football playoff, his record was uh, was four and eight at Cincy that first year, but he's he's a guy that I mean he had a really tough situation, really tough situation, with stepping in post Tressel and pre Urban, and then he got retained. Right, so with this Mickey part of the equation, I think Fickle would totally keep a guy like Mickey because he's been there. If you're back to rule, Babber laid out Babber's laid out some great points about rule. Either guy's probably a really good get for Nebraska. I tend to lean a little bit more towards Fickle just because of his Big Ten background, but but you can't count Rule out because he played in the Big Ten. Hour two's on the way, it's Hale Varsity, and we're presented by Currency. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back with you, it's Hour 2, it's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency. For all your equipment financing needs, go Currency. And uh, we'll spend time with Scott Docterman here in about 20 minutes. We're going to reschedule Coach Barnett uh, for uh, a later date and uh, get his uh, thoughts and picks for sure. Uh, there's a lot of smoke today around Matt Rule. Is he the leader today? Who's the favorite today, right? It's an ever-changing Feels like day by day, hour by hour with this Nebraska coaching search. Is it close to the finish line in the next 48 to 72 hours? Depends on who you're listening to and what you're reading. But the uh, the the smoke from uh, the the Husker chimney may be spelling out Matt rule. We'll know when we know Uh, numbers to get in here this hour at four, six, six, three, seven. 7-6-4-6-6-37-76-800-825-5865. And it's been a, well, it, it's been a incredible race here with when you look at the, the contestants, right, the horses slash coaches, you've had Mickey in the race, you've had Matt Rule in the race that was uh, very prominent right after the you know the, the 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 second week of October after he got let go from Carolina, that picked up some steam and then went radio silent for a bit and then you've heard uh, 
about Gary Patterson for a bit. There's been some Bronco Mendenhall love. You got a lot of horses in this race. Luke Fickle, the last uh, 24 to 48 hours, maybe maybe more so wishful thinking. Uh, but I I could have talked myself into that, put myself in Matt, Matt Rule's shoes or Luke Fickle's shoes and looking at the Nebraska job. And we were talking with Dolman about this last Friday with things seeming to be cool on Rule, right? Is he a guy that would, would really want the Penn State job if A&M opens up here? Say they get a 50-burger dropped on them by LSU and they just... J.R. Ewing and his family passed the the the, the uh, cowboy hat around, and there's 87 million in that hat. Said Jimbo, get the hell out of here, go to West Virginia. I mean, Matt Rule would probably like to go back to Texas, but here and now, Matt Rule on Good Morning Football is going nuts, going nuts that he's not coaching right now. He's done his Ireland thing. He's had time with the family. And now he's Jonesing. And the best job open right now is Nebraska. Wisconsin's not named uh, Leonard, but it looks like that's the sign. Uh, you look at what Kansas did as they upped Leopold, uh, as he'll be getting a bump. Uh, you had DeBoer get his raise. You had Stoops get his raise. Aus- Aus- Auburn is in play for that gig, right? Where are they going to go? Is it the lane train or... Do they go out of left field? See, when I look at Matt Rule and his media tour, it was to, to see if he liked it and was any good at it. That was pre-planned, right? I mean, we, we had talked about that a couple weeks back, right? He's going to do some TV tour, and, and he's really answered questions honestly. He's uh, been very upfront about missing football. And uh, we played the audio with Mike Babcock a little earlier uh, on Matt Rule wanting to, to have a spot to settle down, he left for the NFL to try and go win a Super Bowl. He wanted the, to win at the highest level. And, and he fits, Matt Rule fits, with what Trev Albert's vision is. What what does the next coach at Nebraska need slash have to do? Well, you need to win. How do you get that down in the Big Ten? What's been missing from Nebraska football the last several years? Well, physicality has been missing. What else has been missing from Nebraska football? Depth and development, right? You don't have uh, high-level talent pushing high-level talent followed by high-level talent. You've got a a squad of maybe about 25 on each side of the football, and then it may get a little thin where guys aren't ready to step in if called upon and not have minimal drop-off. That's where Nebraska's gotten crushed, and that can happen to a lot of programs. You're just not used to seeing that when you think back to Nebraska football. So you need to have depth, you need to have development, you need to have line of scrimmage understanding, you need to be a builder, you need to be a developer, and quite honestly, Matt Rule fits that to a T. We've said that before, we believe that now, and you have a guy like Luke Fickle. Uh, He uh, fits that to a T, and he's done it. He's just not really done it outside of Ohio. He's done it at Cincinnati, he's risen them to high levels, and it's one thing to Harken back to the AAC and think of all the coaches who've come out of the AAC, Elijah, that once they got their bump to power five, be it Frost or be it Herman, the one guy that's done well has been Rule, right? He went to a power, he went to the Big 12 and and shortly by year two, by year three, seven wins, 11 wins. Uh, did it at a really high level. Uh, Fickle's been in the AAC, but Fickle's also played Notre Dame in the non-conference, rocked them. Fickle's also uh, played uh, Bama and Georgia and, and, and hung pretty well there. And so he's, he's proven himself, and Fickle's a guy that's going to have to make that jump to the Power Five now in the Big 12 next year. So who's the favorite today? Right now, if you had to put money down, if I'm putting Elijah's money down, I think there's something real close to Matt Rule today. If I'm putting my own money down, I, I like the, the Matt Rule stuff we're hearing today as well. Something about that seems to have legs, especially whenever you've made a great point that we were talking a couple of weeks ago about how what we heard was that Matt Rule did have interest in going and doing TV or radio or, or something. He wanted to sit out, man, right? He, he wanted to sit out, but now he's gone and, and done this little media tour, and maybe he's decided... You know what? I I did this whole Good Morning Football thing, and 
just going and talking about football makes me want to be a football coach mm-hmm. even more. And I've talked with my son, and he says, you know what, Dad? I've seen you doing the, the podcast, and I've seen you doing the TV, and I like you better as a football coach. I want you to coach football. And, and that might be the last straw that Matt Rule needed to say, you know what? I need to go be a football coach. But you look at that, and the timing seems interesting. What we're hearing sounds interesting. But I'll also say the timing with Fickle could also make sense. With Cincinnati poised to make a jump to the Big 12, do you want to have to change your recruiting base from something that is – you know more he can go oh. kick ass and take names in the big 12 with with where he's at right now but he just got bumped not long ago to 5 million if you're going to dig fickle out of cincy it's going to take 8 million and what nebraska can offer in facilities and also an nil and and i think push comes to shove fickle really wants to get back to the big 10 he passed on Michigan State, so so maybe that wasn't right for him. Totally get it. Uh, he wants the Ohio State job. Is he going to st- still hold out for if and when Ryan Day heads to the NFL? That's the question. How soon is, is that going to happen if you're Ryan Day? Because he wants Ohio State. Uh, didn't he really I- – I thought he was going to get a harder look at Notre Dame. Notre Dame went with their interim. Uh, Coach Freeman, who's done a nice job this year. We'll see if they knock off USC. But the other part of that, too, though, I mean, Fickle's a guy who's jumped. He's not stayed at jobs very long. But first, you got to land him. you got to sign him. And, and to me, if we're going to do timeline this thing, it, it, it is identifying, okay, there's a guy that is out of football from the NFL but not far removed from college. He's not been a part of NIL but he, he can figure it out. He's a guy who's made really good hires in Texas, even though he's not a Texan. But he's, a, he's an honorary Texan if you talk to high school coaches down there. He's a guy that's from New York City, went to Penn State, played a linebacker position there, walk-on backer, and then went down to, to Temple, right? You know, and, and did his thing in Philly. So he's been in two really nice recruiting bases. That's the unknown uh, when it comes to the 500 mile radius how do you adapt and adjust to that if in fact uh rules the 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 guy that nebraska goes with from a recruiting base standpoint luke fickle has the ohio valley which is good how much of that can he pull uh, away from an ohio state from a michigan from a michigan state from a notre dame that's that's a crowded neighborhood and it's easier to do at ohio state and right now to win the AAC, what you get to go to Cincinnati. He's been high level. He's put 17 guys in the NFL since he's been there in 2016. Impressive. He's more than, you know, 35, 40 games over 500. Who's with us on the horn? We got Chris on the line. Chris, welcome into Hale Varsity. Go ahead. Hey, guys. Great show. Uh, um, and, but we do also have to remember that Fickle has Big Ten head coaching experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, he did win six games. And uh, uh, so he does have that going for him in that, in that strange uh, year when, when Tressel had to be uh, thrown out. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, it's, it's probably true that Ohio State opens up and Pickle leaves, but I don't know if that's not the case with most any, any coach we get. I don't think we're a destination anymore. Um, and Rule has also been a, a short-lived coach. He doesn't go anywhere for very long. Um, they're both, you know – uh, they both like to, to just stay for a few years and go somewhere else, and that's kind of the nature of the business anymore. But but I'm just wondering, okay, let's say we get either one of these gentlemen as the head coach, um, and I do think they're probably the two best we've been looking at. Um, and But let's say one of these guys uh, comes in and they win, you know, six games next year, eight games a year after that. Do you think they're staying put, or do you think they're going – uh, to the next open coaching job. I, um, I think here's what I t- here's what I think. I think Rule wants two jobs. I think he wants to be the head coach of the New York Giants. I think he wants to be the head coach of Penn State. I think those are his two dream jobs. I think Luke Fickle's dream job is either with Ohio State or an NFL opportunity. I think that's who. Yeah. I think that's who Nebraska. We're way ahead of ourselves. But if if you land, uh, if Fickle's really an, an option. Uh, that's yeah. how you could lose him, but who cares? At least you, you get something or somebody, either of these two guys, to stabilize the program. Uh, that that would be extremely yeah. important. That's the first got, and I, one, biggest one step. One more question, if I can. Sure. Uh, I may I may have missed it earlier. Uh, you may have 
talked about it. Um, was Leopold, uh, what, did he get the extension because, uh, because of Nebraska? Do we know? I've kind of read some things that that's, you know, probably the case, but I, you know, don't. Here's what I believe, and Mitch Sherman laid this out. Chris, thank you for the phone call. Appreciate you. you listening, man. Have a good Thanksgiving. I think the, the, the contract extension's been on his desk. Mm-hmm. That's that's what was told to us this morning from, from Mitch Sherman. And if you're Kansas, you're stupid to have not had that on his desk. No, for and a it's while. been on his desk, and it came down to decision time. Do I pursue Nebraska? Do I stay at Kansas? And do I get this thing handled? I mean, it's not spur of the moment. As Mitch laid out, look, the KUADs, <laughs> he's in Maui right now with the basketball team. But. I mean, Lance is going to get a monster raise. He's already won in, in Lawrence this year. He's a hero. He'll be appreciated. And Lance is a pretty loyal guy. I mean, if he was going to leave, it might have been for Wisconsin. I think he loves Nebraska as well. But he, he's got to be really proud of what they've done in short order. And sky's the limit for him, where they can go six, seven, eight wins. They can keep building. Lance isn't the type of guy that's going to bounce after two years. I think that's mo- that, that's most of it. It isn't the money, it isn't it didn't Nebraska, it isn't Wisconsin. It's the fact that, yeah, I'm the leader of these dudes, and I, I can't just take off after two years. I know he left Buffalo. I know he left Whitewater, but he was there probably five, six, seven years. Extended period. He was he was there. He just didn't cut and run at the at the best next best offer. He's taken really tough choices. You're cranking out national championships. And then you go do what? You go to Buffalo, post Turner Gill. Like, mm-hmm. Turner had it rolling, and then they went to hell for a while. And then he takes on Kansas. Mm. No. <laughs> no. You don't do that. But he's ambitious. He's really good. So, the I think Nebraska moved on because I think Lance was, was happy where he was at. I think, I think Lance is happy where he's at, and I think most likely – from what you're hearing, it's probably because you have two guys that you have like a lot too that are both have mutual interest. I, I do believe Fickle and Rule probably both have mutual interest. Sure. Timing with Rule seems to line up a lot better than with Fickle, in my opinion. That's where I'm at right now. Not only from the yeah, TV there, standpoint, there's, but there's, also you, you look at what's going on with the Auburn job. That's what was rumored last week was that, well, maybe Penn State is going to be losing their head coach. It's going to open up and Matt Rule could look there. I think that Lane Kiffin is going to be Auburn's head coach next year. Despite what he says on Twitter, I still think that's mm-hmm. happening. And I think Matt Rule's probably thinking the same thing as well based on what he's hearing. So he's probably going, well, if that Penn State job's not opening, maybe let's go back, circle back around to Nebraska. Yeah, I want to get in. First choice is if Penn State would open up. But, hey, man, Nebraska looks really good. Do we have time for yes. Rule? Here is Matt Rule earlier this week on what podcast? Uh, the 33rd team, and this is about him waiting for the right opportunity. Okay. I don't know what it will be. I just know this. I'll, I'll be involved with football. Um, I'll either be talking about football, teaching football, coaching football. It could be in the NFL. It could be in college. It could be in the Canadian Football League. It could be in high school. I will be involved in football somehow. Um, it'll. It'll. All I know is it will be the right fit. Uh, it'll be a place that 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 gets me and that I get and and we fit well together. So. I do know the most important thing I can do right now is 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 wait and find the right place and the right job and the right people to do this uh, the way that I want to do it. Well, he has done it the right way and and built and some tough situations, and he uh, Baylor uh, is that exclamation point when you think about post Art Bryles and scandal, uh, and he's. A guy that is good on the line. Both these guys, uh, Fickle, a uh, nose guard at Ohio State, coached the defensive line, coached linebackers, rule a, a linebacker, and he's traveled around. He's been in the NFL. He's been uh, at UCLA. He's been a lot of different spots. He's been on both sides of the ball. Both guys are keen on the offensive and defensive line. So that's. That's your starting point if you're Trev, and, and you have a couple of names right there. Scott Docterman from The Athletic on the way. Hail Varsity continues, presented by Currency. And now. And now, back to Hail Varsity Radio. Back with you, it's Hail Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currency, Nebraska, Iowa. Scott Docterman with this from The Athletic. Follow him. Uh, at Scott Doctorman on Twitter. Scott, uh, end of the seasons here. It's, well, it, it's been a, a slow, slow marathon for Nebraska fans. Iowa has kind of 
kicked it up post Ohio State, and here we are right in front of Black Friday. How are you? Oh, you know what? I can't complain. The, the, the temperature is beautiful today, uh, so <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take advantage of that. But it has been, if it's been a slow marathon in Lincoln, it's been just like uh, a ping pong ball. It's like the old game pong, you know, except you turn it up about 300,000 uh, um, RPMs. It's just, <laughs> it's been the wildest year I can remember in Iowa City. We, we've experienced it all this year. Pong was a, was a great game. Will there be more points in a uh, retro version of Pong or Nebraska-Iowa? Uh, that's a good question. I guess uh, it depends on what uh, Nebraska's offense does, both in scoring on its own or giving points to Iowa's defense, which has done a really good job of, of turning uh, turnovers into points. So I think that's probably going to be part of it. But, uh, yeah, I, I think it could turn out either way. I mean, it's just a matter of um, – you know, if, if Nebraska makes some mistakes, uh, Iowa is going to capitalize on, especially on defense. If if not, if they got to be expected to go 75, 80 yards, might be under 30 points total, no question. <laughs> <laughs> Scott Docterman's with us uh, talking Huskers, Hawkeyes, Black Friday, Ale Bar City Radio. Is uh, we'll be on the road uh, for Black Friday, noon to two at the Marriott in Iowa City, uh, right by Kinnick. Scott, you do a, a pregame radio show as well. You've been doing those for a while, correct? Yeah, yeah. I do it at the corner of Melrose and Melrose, right outside Kinnick Stadium. And it, yeah, it's, it's called the Bumper Brigade. It's on the Iowa Radio Network. So it's uh, it, you know we've we've lived through a lot of different uh, weather formations. And, you know, whether it's been really cold and windy for this uh, Black Friday game, or I think we've had a couple that's been pretty nice, too. So I, I'm, I'm thankful on this Thanksgiving weekend that it's going to probably be pretty nice. What flipped for the Iowa offense? We know it's not been great, but it's been better. How did the, the run game kind of get picked up? And it, to, to your knowledge, you know, why why is it better? What what Because Iowa's gotten better as the season's gone on. It has, and it's not really that it's – I mean, part of it, when you go all the way back to the beginning, they only had one scholarship receiver available the first two weeks. And, uh, you know, they, they won 7-3 to three without a touchdown against South Dakota State, and then it backed it up with a sterling 10-7 to seven loss to uh, Iowa State, um, you know, because they just really couldn't throw the ball very much. And, and Sam Laporta was double and triple covered and – uh, but then the offensive line has been the, was the real issue of all of it because they couldn't even stand on its running game. That has gotten better. They have run the ball with a little bit more consistency. And I would say Spencer Petras is throwing the ball much better, too. He's more accurate. And then as, as long as their wide receivers have come along, and, and they're not necessarily great, they've been without Keegan Johnson for all but 14 plays this year. That's been really a, a, it's hurt them a lot. But, but what they've been able to do is just – maximize their opportunities last week it was in the first quarter before sam laporta got hurt and uh, they had you know they scored on their first two drives and then uh you know against wisconsin uh, the defense and special teams put them inside uh, wisconsin's red zone and they maximized it with a pair of touchdowns plus a pick six in it uh against purdue they ran the ball effectively so they've they've done what they've needed to do on offense in the last four games and uh yeah they haven't this is not a good offense. I'm not going to try to kid you, but at least they've taken care of those opportunities when they've arose. And last week was another one late in the fourth quarter. They came up with a big pass to, to kick the game-winning field goal. So uh, that's really been the secret to how Iowa has, has won games and done so on offense is just when they have the opportunities, they take advantage of them, something they really didn't do early in the year. You mentioned the Sam Laporta injury. I saw yesterday it looks like he's trending towards not playing on Friday, but uh, you got a great backup, and his name is escaping me, but he made that the great catch on that final drive for Iowa to go seal the win last week against Minnesota. So tell me what, what that injury for Iowa means, uh, at least for their offense, because I know Sam Laporta, great tight end, probably one of the best in the Big Ten. Yeah, he's he's probably one of the three or four best in the country, and he he's, uh, you know, for a program that, has had a lot of success at that position. He has more catches and yards than any other tight end in Iowa history. So it, it's a killer for them. He is their best offensive player, and it's a it's an in, lower it's a leg injury that's going to cost them this week. Um, maybe if they get to Indianapolis, he, that one's really iffy. They'll probably be able to play in a bowl game. 
Um, and, and so that hurts. But Luke Lachey has stepped up, and his, his dad, Jim Lachey, was an All-American lineman at Ohio State. Made, he was an All-Pro in the NFL a couple of times. He's actually a radio analyst for the Buckeyes as well. So uh, he's been around the game a lot. He's uh, bigger than, than Sam Laporta. He's 6'7", 250, great athletic ability. So he's going to be the next one in line here at Iowa and had some really good catches, as you said, last week, and so they don't come bigger than that one. Uh, so, but what it's going to mean is, is Iowa has leaned on its two tight end formation most of the year. That's been its lead personnel grouping. They're going to have to adjust, and they're probably going to go to more of a an eleven personnel or three wide receiver set a lot more often. And and that's what it usually did in the past. But this year, it's uh, it's because of what I've said, they didn't have enough receivers to really play that grouping. So th- that's probably going to be what they're going to need to do. Brody Breck is a is a bigger bodied wide receiver. He uh, he'll make his money playing baseball. He throws 102 miles an hour as a pitcher. Uh, he's he's also a wide receiver, and he'll probably be the run some of the routes that Sam Laporta has run. But it, it's it's a big loss. Don't get me wrong. I mean, this is somebody that's uh, that's come through in the clutch and and overall for Iowa for a long time. Scott, a, a thought here on on the the Iowa fan base and and where things are at with. Brian Ferentz, uh, have things toned down, or is he still uh, taking a lot of arrows? He has. It's just they haven't been shot as much lately. Gotcha. <laughs> um, you know, and winning does that. But I think you know, I have heard from a lot of Iowa fans that um, that are almost worried that this success means that, oh, okay, everything's going to go away, everything's fine, and he's going to come back, and they want that less than anything. I think they'd rather see him lose than, than, than to have Brian Ferentz back. And that, that's, you know, that's kind of crazy, but it's true. And, uh, and so I, we, he was asked this week, Kirk Ferentz was, about what he thought of his offensive coordinator, being me and Brian Ferentz, just trying not to mention his name, and just making it more about – you know, their, the performance. And he just said, you know, we'll talk about that after the season. And, and so I don't know what that means for Brian. If he'll come back, it's been so tough on him personally, that it wouldn't surprise me if he decides that, that maybe to go to the NFL, his strength is as an offensive line coach. That, that's probably where I would, you know, I think he would be in a, in a perfect world somewhere, but uh, yeah, the, the, the heat is there. It's just, they turned it down to uh, manageable levels right now because they've won four straight games. Iowa Insider Scott Docterman with us here on Hale Varsity Radio talking Huskers and Hawkeyes Black Friday. And Scott, let's flip this around. Defensive side of the ball. It's where the Hawkeyes have been making their money all year long. Uh, that defensive front seven is, uh, is scary, at least in my eyes, Scott, especially when you consider what the Husker offensive line has gone through this season. Tell me a little bit about that Iowa front seven and how they're probably going to attack the Huskers on Friday. This is a really strong unit, and you look at how Minnesota was able to kind of blow them off the ball, and it was really impressive, especially when there were no penalties called in the game for the first time since 1986. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I don't know, you know that they'll, that'll be the same case this week. I, I think you know, one of the impressive parts about this defensive line is that they've got their veterans, the, the, the try-hard tough guys that are the starters primarily, but the talent is in their younger core, and, and they rotate them a lot. I mean, they go nine or ten deep up front, and they've got some really good talent. Um, you know, I would say like uh, sophomore Lucas Van Ness, who's uh, you know uh, an All Big Ten caliber type defensive lineman. I think he's he's going to be a very difficult matchup. You know, probably for your for left tackle T- Turner Cochran, but I or Corcoran. I, and I think uh, you know you got Y A Black and Aaron Graves, who's a true freshman, and, and normally they wouldn't play a true freshman, and certainly not this year when they're this deep. He's just that good. So, you know, and then at linebacker, one of the best players to ever play at Iowa is Jack uh, Campbell. And last week was kind of, I call it the Jack Campbell game, uh, because when things were trending in the wrong direction for Iowa, he came up with two big plays in the fourth quarter. One was a forced fumble on Mo Ibrahim, and the second one was an interception that he returned for a touchdown but was whistled out of bounds, even though he wasn't. So I call it the miss six. Um, and and uh, he's, but he's a tremendous talent, an All-American, and uh, and so they they really are pretty experienced, very tough, very physical up front, and uh, you know, and then, and then their secondary is, you know, they haven't had as many interceptions as they've had in the past, but 
they're a pretty veteran unit back there, and pretty salty, and have some playmakers. So this defense is as good as I can remember at Iowa, and they've had some good ones in the past, and they've had to be that way to compensate for what's uh, one of the worst offenses statistically in Big Ten history. Scott, we'll end it with this, uh, with the coaching carousel in Nebraska, the, the name today that's picking up some steam, and it's maybe more of a hope, but uh, your reaction when you hear Luke Fickle in Nebraska? That would be an outstanding hire. I think Luke Fickle, uh, you know, we were all kind of wondering about him when he took over for Jim Tressel for that year, and it wasn't a very good year at Ohio State, but he's really done a nice job at Cincinnati in building that program. And, um, you know, a good recruiter. He's kept it at a high level, and if that's the, if that's the direction that Trev Alberts goes, uh, I don't think that's a bad one. I mean, I think there's going to be a le- level of both excitement and disappointment for Nebraska fans because this has gone on for so long. Not unlike what you get on Christmas morning, where you may get everything you want and you just like, oh, you're disappointed it's over. <laughs> but I think that might be the case if it's Luke Fickle. Um, I've heard new names every day like everybody else has. But, but if he's the one that's coming there, um, I think you're going to be, you know, he. He's exactly what Nebraska needs in that that he's a builder, and he carries kind of a low profile. And I think that's really important right now as Nebraska tries to build a foundation to be able to compete, not only with uh, the the hierarchy of the Big Ten, but just with everybody. And and Luke Fickle certainly fits that profile. He understands what it takes to to win in the Big Ten, and he understands how to, to build a program, which is what he's done at Cincinnati. Does that seem outlandish that he'd leave Cincinnati for Nebraska? No, Nebraska's a step up from Cincinnati. Even though Cincinnati's going to the Big 12, uh, Nebraska has the resources. Nebraska has the fan base. It has the, the money to lure uh, players through its NIL. Nebraska, you know, I mean, we, we, I've talked for decades that Illinois is a sleeping giant. Mm-hmm. No, and Nebraska now is because it's been so long since Nebraska has competed at a high level. So uh, all it takes is the right coach and the right, um, and the right mentality and developmental program. And, and Nebraska will be right up there and can compete at a higher level, sustained at a higher level. So, yeah, I think that would be that would be a move up from Cincinnati to any of the higher-level programs in the Big Ten. Scott, we'll see you on Black Friday. Best to you and your fam. Have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving to you, and uh, drive safe over across I-80. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, Tail Varsity Radio. Time for a Jack Doc Wednesday, Nebraska Orthopedic Center. Dr. Brandon Seifert with us. Dr. Brandon, you ready for some turkey? Absolutely, buddy. Getting to have the old grill fired up tomorrow morning for some smoking. How about oh. yourself? Uh, well, I'm going to be at your house because you're going to have smoked turkey. Uh, you just <laughs> found that out, uh, and I'm sure you're, you're, you're accommodating. Matthew Stafford on our mind. He missed uh, the Rams Week 10 game against the Cards. Dealing with a concussion, he returned against the Saints, but got, uh, well, spiked and had to exit uh, in the third quarter after being tackled and taking a shot to, to the head. Well, let's talk about concussion protocol and how dicey that's been with the NFL this year, specifically the process of clearing a guy who maybe it looks like came back too soon. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's been interesting looking at this over the last couple of years. There's actually quite a few kind of articles and press releases about how, you know, NFL, NFL Players Association is trying to modify kind of this return to play program. Um, it's still, unfortunately, that whole window of kind of recovery is, is hard to, it's hard to make it kind of black and white just overall in terms of, okay, it's going to be this many days for everybody. It's because concussion recovery is, is pretty variable. Um, you know, as we discover more about, you know, what are truly, you know, concussion symptoms, what are some of the kind of lingering effects that can be there for a while, and is it okay if you do have some of those things to, you know, allow them to try to go back through a protocol, all those things are still, I think, kind of and worked out, and it's still kind of an evolving process. I think we still have a pretty good feel on on what that looks like. Um, I'm pretty hard on, you know, you need to have all those symptoms resolved, you know, for the most part before you're going back and doing any kind of like aerobic activities. Um, I think always with these, that just big emphasis on like, permanent damage can be established even after just one of these concussions. And so that's always our goal is, you know, 
athlete safety is always the biggest issue, especially with something like this that can be so permanent. So we're, we're really strict on that. Uh, but again, the hard part about concussions and any type of brain trauma is just, you know, the subjectivity of it. It's, it's what an athlete, you know, reports to you for symptoms. You know, either A, they, they know what the symptoms are that they don't want to tell you about, or B, they might not even know what those symptoms are that might be from a concussion. So there's always that battle with it. Um, you know, but for, for my protocol I go through with our athletes, it's always when we want them to be totally you know, asymptomatic before we ever start progressing them. If you said, Doc, what's kind of the you know, average on a return or some kind of you know, concussion recovery protocol, I would say it's usually somewhere in that kind of five- to seven-day range is where we see most of our athletes fall into. Um, and hopefully that's kind of going to be the case here. But you start to you know, push this too early. In particular, if you start to do the contact piece too early, you can really cause some significant trauma. Um, otherwise, the other issue is, is just making sure you work through those kind of smaller symptoms, the concentration issue, the balance issue, all those kinds of things. Otherwise, if you start pushing too early, then you really can kind of set that bar in recovery down the road a long ways. You mentioned balance and and focus as a couple of symptoms. What are what are more of the uh, the light to severe? I mean, how many different symptoms are, are you aware of and that are part of that clearance for the concussion protocol? Yeah, you know, great question, Chris. So this is something we try to educate our athletes on. Our athletic trainers do just a fabulous job of, of going over this with our athletes. So, you know, the big thing there, kind of the classic symptoms, headaches, kind of number one. So headache, um, is there any, you know, sense of confusion, which usually there's not a lot of that most of the time. Um, so headaches, confusion, dizziness is part of it, kind of balances a little bit off. Uh, that sensitivity to bright lights is a big part of it. Um, the other big thing is just being able to concentrate. In particular, what's really important is our student athletes, our college athletes, our high school students, just being able to get back in the classroom and focus on lectures. You know, that's a big deal, obviously, for any of our students, in particular our college athletes. And that's where we see it a lot. I would say that's probably the biggest symptom I see and struggle we see in our college athletes is it really does impact their grades. And sometimes it's subtle enough that they may report to you like, hey, Doc, I don't feel like my concentration is a problem or I feel like I can do everything for the most part, pay attention to lecture. And then you start to see their grades start to slip. That uh, short-term memory change you can have, their ability to kind of retain new information can really go away. And so those are things that are kind of scary when you think about athletes who are having these injuries. Um, and so those are some things that we'll ask them questions about. And it's interesting how many of them will report that. Um, and even some will have even some subtle symptoms that maybe have even kind of progressed through the return to play program, not reporting any symptoms. Maybe they do well enough on the impact test, but they, they go back and play, but yet you start looking at them and they've had this kind of downward trend on their grades, their GPA over you know, a period of four to six weeks. So those kind of things are out there. So trying to keep an eye out for those things is really important. Um, obviously, some of those really kind of subtle symptoms that are there, again, the athlete may not even recognize it, but it may be a deal where you might get a call from a professor, teacher on campus, or even a parent that notices it. Well, yeah, that's almost where I was going to go, Dr. Brandon. And that, what's stopping an athlete from saying, you know what, I don't have any symptoms, I don't think I have a concussion anymore, and they progress through the return to play protocol, yet they still have a concussion. Is there anything in place that can prevent that? Because I, I think back to the Tua injury earlier this year where he claimed it wasn't a concussion, and then as we all found out the next week, it was most likely a concussion. Yeah, again, another great point. And so I think what's nice about the protocol is there's kind of those graduated steps you go through. So, you know, you have your concussion, then you take that phase one, and it's, you know, rest, where it's, you know, take away all the stimulation. So phone, light, TV, just get in a dark room, nice and relaxed, taking it easy for a couple days, whether it's a day or two, let symptoms calm down. Then it's that kind of gradual kind of work back into some aerobic activity, a little bit of some balance activity. And then once that feels good, then you start to pick it back up to non-contact drills and eventually contact but as you go through that process it's amazing how many of those kids that will say hey doc i'm completely asymptomatic and then you start to do those things with them and then all of a sudden symptoms return and so i think we catch a lot of those athletes who are in that window period where they feel asymptomatic and then you start to do stuff with them and then symptoms return so i think fortunately that kind of slow protocol um, in terms of that return aerobic and that kind of phase i think that helps us pick up a lot of these athletes um, so I think there's very few that get through that still are having those symptoms. Um, and then usually as we kind of go through that whole protocol, you kind of tease that out. Okay, So I think there's very few that get missed. But in the end, if somebody's totally asymptomatic and literally it's just kind of a maybe a slow dropping in grades, if they don't report that to us or their athletic trainer, then, yeah, I mean, that could happen. 
Dr. Brandon, to wrap, just you mentioned one shot could could be uh, the end. Uh, it could be that severe, uh, just with just how mm-hmm. fragile the head area and uh, brain region is with concussions. Touch a little bit further on that if you can. Yeah, you know, and that's always if you say, well, well hey, Doc, what's, you know, parents' essence, what's the big deal about if we go back too soon? And it's this whole concept of this thing called a second impact or second hit syndrome. And so if you have some kind of closed head injury like a concussion, um, the issue there is, you know, the brain needs a certain amount of time for to recover, to kind of regrow those vessels in the area, to kind of regrow the tissue in the area, or at least repair the tissue in the area. What happens is if you have another event, so a second hit syndrome is what we call it. So let's say somebody goes back after concussion too soon, symptoms are gone, brain's still healing, and then, you know, boom, you take another big impact to that area. Now you've got all those inflammatory cells and things there. That second hit during that recovery phase causes a lot more extensive damage and can really set up some permanent damage. And it could be very severe to the point where it could be life-threatening if you get a second hit and they're still bleeding in the area, healing in the area. And so that that's the real deal. And that's always the biggest fear going back is that risk. It's that second impact risk. That's what has everybody concerned. Because we know that can be the permanent damage that gets set up and ultimately could be life-threatening if you, you know, have a pretty extensive you know, head trauma that's not totally healed and you go back too soon. So that's always the goal. And that's, again, that second impact syndrome that we're trying to avoid. And that's the thing you have to emphasize to families why we're so aggressive about treating this appropriately. Dr. Brandon, have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks for the update today. Okay, fellas. Have a great Thanksgiving. Take care. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time on Thanksgiving Eve, off tomorrow, Black Friday at noon. For you with Hale Bar City Radio Roadshow. We started in Ireland, we end in Iowa City. We'll have a pint or several on the way. Not wall driving, but you get my point. What a season it's been is the coaching search coming to a screeching halt. Time will tell with that, and we'll be here for you with Hale Bar City Radio, ESPN Lincoln, and our Hale Bar City Radio affiliates. Uh, we'll be on uh, when it's time to tell you about the hire and react to the hire. Uh, on ESPN Lincoln, and, of course, uh, StreamYard and Twitter, all that good stuff. Reminder about your friends at Red Zone Tickets. They have been selling fun since 2001. And if you have tickets you want to buy or sell, think of Red Zone Tickets. Husker Volleyball, Creighton Hoops, all the concerts you want to see, theater uh, performances, and, of course, the College World Series, an earned A-plus Better Business Bureau rating, and the Red Zone Tickets is local, and they're proud of it. Out of Omaha, 100% guarantee on all orders. You'll receive authentic tickets and experiences you'll never forget. And check that item off your bucket list and create memories that last a lifetime. Log on today, redzonetickets.com, redzonetickets.com. We'll probably know for certain, well, Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We do have uh, an update here from Brandon Walker, noted Mississippi State fan, so let's keep that in mind here. But he tweeted out, uh, obviously, sorry, let's, let's set this up a little bit better. Brandon Walker with Barstool Sports, the National College Football Podcast with him, and he tweeted out an hour ago, here's the latest update from what I'm hearing through my constant dealings with 80s across the country. Kiffin to Auburn, Matt Rule to Nebraska. He also says that uh, Bronco Mindenhall and Tom Herman are likely to get Power 5 jobs soon, possibly this cycle. If these are right, I expect full credit. If they're wrong, I was just kidding. Sure, and uh, <laughs> we'll post our, our Gary Barnett interview. Uh, Barney had a little insight on Dion and where he is at for the Colorado job. But it, it really shifted from 24 hours ago about Fickle gaining some steam, mm-hmm. and now you had all this silence around rule to by the time Friday hit and that, that snippet you played earlier from good morning football about his son saying, dad, you got to coach. Maybe that's what he is waiting on. And you got to wonder if there's been some sort of 24 hour deadline proposed. If you're Trev, if you're Nebraska to get things locked up. Well, just think about it from Trev's point of view. Wouldn't you like to have this out of the way before Thanksgiving? 
you know, enjoy some time with your family, a stress-free day of watching football, knowing that you and got then, your next coach locked up. And then go up. watch Mickey and the gang go get it handled uh, potentially on Friday. Or I was going to say on Friday, while the team's doing that, you can, you know, get all the T's crossed and I's dotted for your press conference whenever that's going to be. Sure. And you can make an announcement Friday after the game. Saturday then, morning even. And then have a, have a, a presser Saturday or Sunday. Oh, sure, sure. Right, to, to welcome, but you can make the announcement. So, Black Friday, noon to 2, ESPN Lincoln, on the road. Hail Varsity Radio on the road, Iowa City. The Marriott, the uh, rooftop tailgate. Come see us, come say hi, and then Real Red Reaction follows. A best to you and your family. Thanks for listening and uh, being part of us here. And uh, we'll talk to you on Friday with Hail Varsity.